welcome to the Manic Pixie Dream Vlog. I'm your host, Caroline Georges, and welcome today. Um, so it's a day whatever of quarantine and stuff. I know I haven't done a vlog in a minute, but I don't know. I just, um, honestly, a lot's been going on. Like, too much has been going on. I've just been super busy and stuff. But with quarantine happening, I just got, I don't know. It's just, ugh, oh, gosh, where is my mind? It's just, it doesn't. You know, it was weird. So, okay, I'll start this with, um, I spoke to my sexual assailant, the comic who sexually assaulted me in my apartment and jerked off to me. Um, when I, okay, this is what happened. So, I knew I wasn't alone. I knew I wasn't alone. I knew I wasn't the only girl this guy fucked with. And I knew it. I fucking knew it. For a long time, I thought I was alone. For a long time, I thought the only reason why he did what he did to me was because I'm a fucking stripper and I had it fucking coming. And I thought it was... I thought it was all my fault. I thought, I mean, and it's... I thought it was all my fault for a long time. I thought, man, I could have seen that coming a mile away and I didn't, and I didn't do anything to stop it when it happened. Because he was my friend and I cared about my friendship with him. And when I met with him, I remembered our friendship. And I remember how good he used to make me feel being around him as his friend. And I was reminded, oh, holy shit, this is what everyone sees. This is what everyone's seeing. People are not seeing this guy jerk off to a girl who's crying. That's not what people are seeing. They're seeing this. They're seeing this nice guy. And then I thought about me and how people see me. You know, recently I've kind of been sort of fascinated with the femme fatale, like just the idea of the femme fatale. And it's actually a very interesting history, and I'll get into it a little bit. So the femme fatale, she was born of like out of the social fear of women in the workplace in the 1940s within film noir. And that was when she was created because at the time women were transitioning in and out of the workplace because of the war and stuff. So anyways, so when the war ended, women wanted to remain in the workforce, which was a threat to men and was a threat to men's dignity and sexuality, that women wanted to remain in the workforce. Women wanted to remain at jobs that they had or gained while men were at war and could not do them anymore. So anyways, so a femme fatale, and it's in the Hayes, the Hayes, like the, the, the Hayes code or whatever, the Hayes, so anyways, the, the Hayes rating system from like way back in the day where it's like, you know, where it was like, where they like, you know, Psycho got an R rating because they had a toilet and stuff, you know what I mean? Like Hayes, it was super silly. There, there, it's, it's actually mostly very ridiculous. And a lot of the rules that were written in the 1940s are still in the Hayes code, in the Hayes it's really ridiculous, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. I'm here to talk about femme fatales. But femme fatales, my point is, it was born of sexism. And the point is, it's in the Hayes rating system that femme fatales cannot win. That the femme fatale, the threat of the femme fatale has to be eliminated within the story. Or it cannot be shown in theaters. That was a rule. What happened to the femme fatale was she was either killed, went to prison, or she was proven to have not been a femme fatale all along and was simply a victim of her circumstances. So which am I? I ask. What should be my fate? Because I do use my sexuality as a tool and as a weapon when need be. I do. I do, I do, I do. I'm not sorry. 
because you know what? I am a victim to my circumstances. I am. And, um, and I have been oppressed by men to within an inch of my life and then some. You wouldn't believe the psychological warfare that's going on in my mind because of men. I... So yes, I am a victim of my circumstances. And I can prove once and for all that I am not a femme fatale. I can. By, by just not being one anymore. And, um, but you know, when femme fatales, you know, the thing is when the femme fatale, the threat of the femme fatale is not eliminated and there's been movies, Gone Girl, Fatal Attraction, Ex Machina, all three of those movies, the femme fatale survives and it's very unnerving. It's very unnerving when the femme fatale survives and there's something to be said there. But in the times where it's revealed that the femme fatale wasn't a femme fatale all along and was simply a victim of her circumstances, like in LA Confidential or in um, Chinatown, for example, those women, they either were destroyed by their circumstances or they were saved from their circumstances by a man. But then there are the other times where the femme fatale is killed and the femme fatale is, goes to prison and the femme fatale is punished very severely for her crimes. She doesn't use her sexuality to gain a partner and to become a wife and to become a mother. She doesn't use her sexuality for those things. She uses her sexuality for money and greed. And I've only ever used my sexuality as a tool or a weapon to survive. And, um, but I thought, because I'm a stripper, and because I do use my sexuality as a tool to get ahead and to get things, and sometimes, yes, I have been callous. Sometimes, yes, I... My experiences in abuse have been severe, have been severe, and I responded to them severely in kind, and I think that makes no nothing but perfect sense. And I was sexually assaulted by my friend who I trusted, who came into my life to help me with a Me Too podcast where we talked about sexual assault and boundaries and stuff and he betrayed me. Am I a villain because I wanted revenge? Am I a villain? Am I a bad person because I wanted revenge? You see, I'm looking towards the future and I see that there are going to be a lot of male comics who are not going to want to work with me or have anything to do with me because I was sexually assaulted by their friend and I wasn't silent about it and I wasn't silent and I named him and I called him out and I shouted him out and I realized at one point in the conversation that my sexual assailant, when we talked, when we spoke, I realized at one point in the conversation, he actually did feel entitled to my, my silence. He did. 
I told him, I was like, look, dude, like, I, I need to go to comedy clubs. I need to go to the comedy store. I need to go to the improv. I need to go to these places. And, I'm, and I don't always go because I'm scared I'm going to see you. And I'm not always strong enough to be able to see you. So it's very upsetting seeing you. And then he stopped and he stopped hearing me and he stopped listening to me and he closed his heart to me for that moment and he turned around on me and he said, well, I'm scared to go to comedy clubs too because people have told me that you've been talking about me. What do we do? What are women supposed to do? Because I don't know what I'm going to do. I know I damaged my career in comedy because I was sexually assaulted and because I named him. And any action I took against him would have been, would have been completely justifiable based on the pain that, I was ca that he caused me. I almost took my own life after that happened. I was very close to taking my own life. But his career in comedy is more important than me, than my life, you know, like than my life, than me being alive, than me staying alive. That's how it feels, you know, and the thing is, is that like, it's just, there's no playbook, there's no rule book, there's nobody, nobody comes in, there's no fairy godmother that like, poof, she pops into your life and tells you what to do after you get sexually assaulted. There's nothing like that. You're all alone. You're all on your own. And you don't, you're in pain and you don't know what to do. And when all of this started happening, when other women started coming forward about my sexual assailant and what he was doing to other girls and that sort of thing, which was like bullying, harassment, and sometimes he was sexually aggressive with women, with other women, like grabbing their faces and trying to force them to kiss him. Um, one girl, he tried to take off her shirt and then kept trying to take off her bra while she was saying no and stuff like that. It was just, you know what one of the biggest this is one this one really bugged me this one especially this one account from this one girl really bugged me about him she her father had cancer so she went home for two months to be with him while he went through chemo for two months and then she came back and she started doing comedy again and she had rejected the sexual advances of my sexual assailant and when she came back she saw him at a mic and then he messaged her after the mic and he said I hope your dad gets cancer again, so you have to leave town and quit comedy. So, really, dude, you're gonna you're gonna come, you're gonna sexually assault me. You're gonna sexually assault me, and then not only that, you're not gonna stop there. You're not gonna stop there. You're gonna keep going. You're gonna keep doing this. You're gonna keep shitting on women. You're gonna keep fucking with women. I wasn't enough. I wasn't enough for you. I wasn't. It wasn't. I wasn't fucking enough. Why wasn't I enough? I was enough for my other rapists. I think. Or maybe I wasn't. Maybe for every sexual assault and every rape I've experienced, I have just become somehow connected to slews of women who have also experienced the same things from the same hands that I experienced abuse from too. And um, yeah. But going back to the femme fatale, Can I prove that I haven't been a femme fatale all along? Can I prove that? Can it be proven in my story that I'm not really a femme fatale? That I'm not really, that trope doesn't apply to me, that I'm just a human being doing my best. And I did my best in that situation. And I lost. 
and I lost a lot more than a man who sexually assaults women and harasses women. But I had him running scared. I had him running scared. I had him scared. And I'm glad. And I hope that he is scared shitless to do it again. And for now, I feel like that was enough to stop him. But I worry about him going on tour. I worry about him going to comedy clubs across the country. And what could happen. And how little power women would have if they were sexually assaulted or if they were raped by somebody who was from California and moved back and went back to California right after he sexually assaulted and raped them. That makes it a lot harder. Mind you, when I reported him to the police for sexually assaulting me, nothing fucking happened. This guy could get away with some very serious crimes and he knows now that he can. So, do I, am I, am I just like, do I just have to sit back like, well, I guess I just have to sit back and wait for him to rape somebody. I mean, cause I mean in that situation, I mean my account of what happens is actually helpful and can actually help someone. Right now, it's like it really can't help anybody. It can't even help me. It's best for me to just move on and act like it never happened, and that's what I'm going to do. I even told this guy, hey, to repair your reputation, you can say hi to me, and I'll say hi back. I told him that. I was spinning. I was totally spinning. I had no one to hold on to. I had no one to talk to. I had no one to just, I had no one to like just look me in the eye and just say everything's fine, you're doing fine, or like, nobody telling me you're going in the wrong direction, go back, go this way, or do this, or say this, or this is how you should do things, this is how it is, move forward this way. Nobody came into my life to fucking do that. No one. I found no one to help me. No one. Not really. You know, I'm not allowed to say this. But patriarchy is a fact. It's a fact. It's not a construct. It's how shit is and how shit has always been and is how shit will always be. One day, you know, not one day. I mean, this isn't going to happen, I don't think. I mean, I could. It could. This is what could happen. If one day every man on the planet decided, they all just got into cahoots together and would just be like, fuck this, let's make women slaves. Let's make women companions and maids and servants. Let's reduce women back to that and that only. They could. They could. Men could. They could. If you think about it that way. Women, I mean, I mean, what could we do? You know, we couldn't do that. Men could. They outnumber us. Not in numbers, but in strength, they outnumber us. In muscle mass and bone density, they outnumber us quite a bit. And they tend to own more firearms than women do. So yes, I'm correct in saying men could do this to us, and they have. I mean, Iran, way back in the day, was actually a very progressive place. And then all of a sudden, like, this dictator got in charge, and then he was just like, women need to wear clothes head to toe, and if they don't, they're beaten in public. That happened. Again, it's Iran, but still, I mean, at the same time, it could happen. 
that could happen and that is the reality. Women have the equality that they have because men have allowed it. And they've allowed it because women bitch and whine and complain like nobody's business. And we bitched and whined and complained throughout the suffragette movement and so on and so forth. And we're whining and bitching and complaining to this day for shit that we want and shit that we need. And we're not going to stop whining, bitching, and complaining until men give it to us. And men have to be the one to give it to us. Speaking of the femme fatale, there's one that I like. Well, there's one I find that, that's interesting and that I, that I identify with and that I like. And it's, okay, it's in The Dark Knight Rises. And it's actually, it's Catwoman. She's a femme fatale, or she's presented as a femme fatale, but she reveals herself right away that she is not a femme fatale, that she is in fact a victim of her circumstances by saying that she says that once, if you do what you have to do to survive, society stops letting you do anything else. And that's very true, and that's very true for my situation as well. Once a stripper, always a stripper. Since I'm a stripper, and since I've come forward as being a stripper, and I'm open about being a stripper, I will always be a fucking stripper, and the society will not probably let me uh, any room to be much else. So, Catwoman, she wants to find a clean slate machine. That doesn't actually exist. She wants a clean slate. So she's using her her abilities as a thief and as a fighter and as a seductress to get what she needs in order to get this 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 machine that will give her a new start. That'll give her a fresh clean slate. So she's not a femme fatale. Her intentions are actually very noble and good. And aren't for money and greed, but just for a life where she doesn't have to be a criminal anymore. So she'll be a criminal in order to not be a criminal anymore. But then she goes to prison. So, and then her, then that's when the, her, the narrative of her being a femme fatale is over and she's reborn again afterwards, a good guy, and she helps save the world, right? But the clean slate is handed to her by her love interest, by a man, by the hero of the story. She doesn't do anything to get it. Everything that she's done in her life to get the clean slate machine was fruitless. A man had to give it to her. And then there's a switcheroo where the woman who was the love interest and involved with Batman from the beginning, it turns out she was the femme fatale all along, the true femme fatale all along. So it's actually very clever, and I liked it. Um, but, yeah. But then Catwoman, she like goes to France and marries Batman at the end, and that's the best part. And um, anyways, I just, I don't know. Are we just, women are just, have women been given everything by men? Have men given us everything that we have? And that everything that we've done to get ahead or to get what we wanted was all fruitless. That the clean slate women tr truly desperately want in their lives doesn't actually exist unless it's given to us by a man. Food for thought. Anywho, I'm a little rusty. This was, I don't know, well, actually, what am I saying? This is probably the best vlog I've ever done in my life. Um, look, as far as the coronavirus goes, look, I'm just gonna be honest with y'all, I really think this is a ruse created by the government in order to gain world power. But just for the sake of keeping everyone calm, let's just stay at home, wash your hands. If you're under 70 you're fine and you're probably not at very high risk and some people get severe cases of the coronavirus and you know I've okay look I don't want to go down in history as being one of those crazy chicks that like you know had all these conspiracy theories but if I'm right this is gonna I'll have this vlog up on my YouTube and I'll be like ha see I was right it was a ruse
and now we're all communists. Um, no. I just, um, I just, it, when, when it's all over, I just feel like everyone's going to feel like they have a fresh start and a clean slate. And I'm going to give that to my sexual assailant. I'm going to give him a fresh start and a clean slate. And I'm going to give him a chance to make better choices and to treat women better. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do my part as a woman in comedy. And I'm going to befriend young female comics with no power. And I'm just going to talk to them. And I'm going to talk to these girls. And I'm just going to ask them. When the, when it comes up, if it comes up organically, if I can bring it up, just be like, hey, has anyone ever fucked with you? Has a guy fucked with you? Has a guy sexually, has a guy hurt you in some way and you want to talk about it and you feel like you can't? And most of the time these girls are going to say no. Everyone's been perfectly nice. But every once in a while, one of these girls is going to be like, you know what, I got some really weird DMs from this comic. Or this one comic grabbed my ass. You know what I mean? Maybe it'll be stuff like that. You know what I mean? But look, if a girl tells me a comic jerked off to her and groped her, and she says the name of the guy who sexually assaulted me, What am I going to tell her? What am I going to say? I'm, I, I'll have to tell her the truth. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to me. This is how people responded to me. So you can move forward and you have my account, you know? I, she'll have my account if it happens again, if she was sexually assaulted, if my sexual assailant doesn't change and makes choices like he's made in the past and keeps doing that, then what am I going to tell these girls? What am I going to tell, like, what am I going to say to these girls? I have to be honest. Like, don't do anything. Seriously, forget about it. It's not worth it. It is a man's world. And it allows room for rape sexual assault and sexual misconduct and sexual harassment. And that is a fact. Rape, sexual assault, sexual misconduct, and sexual harassment is the easiest crime men can get away with in this country. Easiest crime. And these crimes destroy women. <sighs> Male sexuality is a weak thing. And women who are a threat to men's sexuality have to be killed, have to go to prison, or have to be proven not a threat at all in order for them to survive in this world. I really believe that. Anywho, that's my vlog for today. Happy quarantine. Stay safe. Look, this probably, look, I like about what I said about this being a ruse for government to take full power over everybody. I mean, look, too late. So I guess we're doing this. I guess we're all staying inside. It seems to me, I don't know. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a scientist. I am just a stripper, but this all seems just, I don't know. Doesn't this all seem just like a little bit like, hmm, hmm, weird. It's weird. Like really? Like somebody ate a bat and now we're all unemployed? What?
like men's sexuality, the world is a fallible thing as well. Anyways, that's my vlog for today. Like and subscribe and share. And I'm just going to keep posting these. And I hope they entertain you. And, oh, you know what? One more thing. I watched Louis C.K.'s special. And I wasn't going to. Just because, I mean, I don't, just because, who cares? You know what I mean? Like, it's, all right. Like, cool. But it was pretty funny. It was pretty funny. And my friend, who was his, one of his victims, or he jerked off to her over the phone. She caught him. And she was pretty upset about it. And her situation and coming forward really fucked her up, too. And she really regretted it. When she spoke to the New York Times... They painted the situation like she was one of 100 women that Louis C.K. had gone after in his career. They painted it like that. And she was, when the article came out, she was horrified when she realized that she was one of four and her situation was the worst one. I hope Louis C.K. coming out the victor of this situation does not make her a villain of it. But Louis C.K. has daughters. And I'm someone's daughter. And I know that my father is not perfect. And it would be an unbearable pain to witness seeing your father live in shame and disgrace all your life. Anyways. But the special was good. And Louis C.K. is back. He paid 40 million dollars in damages. He's learned his lesson. Now we can all move on. It's kind of like, I mean, I don't know, with the Louis C.K. situation, I mean, is that, did that fuck up my situation? Did that, I mean, did like making the whole Louis C.K. situation such a big fucking deal? It feels like for some reason, like when O.J. Simpson murdered his white privileged wife, him being acquitted of that murder that he clearly committed was the pound of flesh the black communities needed in order to get over that guy who, what was his face, who started the L.A. riots. What was, oh, you probably know this guy's name, sorry. But anyways, he got beaten to death by cops for speeding. And then it started, and then all of L.A. was on fire for weeks afterwards. And so, anyways, but the murder of O.J. Simpson's wife, who I also don't remember the name of, and maybe should, but she, like, I mean, it, seriously, like, it was like, one, was the, it was the response to that. Like, look, a black man can get away with murdering his white privileged wife. So that makes white cops beating a black man to death okay now. We can settle this, we'll settle it that way. The harsh response to Louis C.K. and what he did was not the pound of flesh I needed to heal and get better. That didn't do anything for me. In fact, that hurt me because now I am that girl who can go on a podcast or go to a news publication and say, hey, I was sexually assaulted by this male comic who had a lot of power and connections over me when I first started comedy and he's being protected by a lot of people. I could do that. I could do that and I could say that and I could say that and tell the truth.
but why do I feel like that's wrong? Why do I feel like it's wrong to do that? Why do I feel so afraid to do that? Because when I was on the precipice of doing that, everything in me, every instinct in me, told me not to. Why was that? Anyways, well, that's fully my vlog. All right, like and subscribe and share, and we're all in this together. I'm going totally insane in quarantine, and, but I am going to, after this is all over, I'm going to go to the movies, I'm going to go to the comic clubs, I'm going to go to open mics, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to strip, I'm going to have a blast. I'm going to live life to the fullest, and it's going to be a clean slate, and it's going to be a fresh start for everybody. And that's how we can see this. It's a fresh start. It's a clean slate. It's just, it's truly a chance to start anew. All right. Like and subscribe, share. Bye.